Yeah, we're all ready. Okay. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, bienvenidos all. I am so happy to welcome uh, folks that are joining us today for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Today, it's our new books showcase and we have an amazing, amazing quartet of poets. Um, uh, just, just a wonderful, wonderful quartet that I know that if you have not heard them, they've all participated and read before in some variation here in one of our formats here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry before but if you have have not had the opportunity uh to hear the poetry of, of christy mave sylvia or moira you are certainly you are in for an amazing amazing experience this afternoon evening, morning, wherever you are joining us from, whichever time zone. I wanna welcome those of you who are here today with us live in our Zoom room. Uh, and those of course, who I know some of you are watching us directly from our Facebook page. So welcome to all of you as well. Well, I'm Sandy Unown, your host. Uh, as I am most Sundays when uh, we hold our readings. And it is always a, a joy and an honor to share this work with Kim Ports Parsons and Don Krieger. I wanna thank them very much for all the support of the series. And of course, to all of you that participate in, in the many various ways that you are able to participate in Cultivating Voices live poetry, whether that's being here for the live reading in Zoom, wa uh, watching over on Facebook, or posting about readings that are uh, posting about readings, poetry events, um, and you know other poetry related news and occurrences. Big news this week of. This week, of course, was the naming of the Poet Laureate here, um, the U.S. Poet Laureate here in the U.S., uh, Ada Limon, and who was, who's um, actually um, actually a member of Cultivated Voices Live Poetry. That doesn't necessarily mean we'll be able to get Ada Limon to read with us. But anyway, uh, very, very grateful for this gathering today. And uh, again, we're in for quite the reading. Just a little bit about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I was sharing with Moira going a little bit down memory lane. You know, we began in March 2020 in response to venues shutting down everywhere so that we could continue to gather and be in community around poetry. We never certainly anticipated that we would have a need to continue uh, this long through the, uh, that the pandemic would continue in this regard, but we've persisted. We've offered numerous variations on our format and have, have hosted now like hundreds of poets um, during our readings. And just again, so, so incredibly grateful for everything that we've been able to share in these past um, two years through, you know, this remarkable thing called Zoom. Um, we began on Facebook Live, of course, and we were reminiscing a little bit about that earlier. Well, I wanna remind you all today that the four poets courtesy of uh, Kim Ports Parsons posting will be posting links to uh, where you can purchase their collections. Of course, I encourage you if you have the resources and you are so inclined to pick up 
a collection or two or three, or honestly, why not go for all four if you've got the resources? Uh, I can assure you, uh, I, I, it's work you're gonna wanna add to your collection. I also wanna remind y'all that during the reading, uh, thank you for uh, keeping muted so that we will be able to hear beautifully our readers speaking and sharing their work. And however, you can use the chat function to your glorious delight uh, to send the love to our readers today. Please, of course, uh, share with love and respect and, and enthusiasm and uh, respect for others in the room as well uh, with what you're posting in the chat. Well, let's get started, shall we? I would, I'm so excited to invite first to read today, Christy, L. Williams, again, um, when I first heard Christy and then learned that Christy's work was coming out, debut chapbook, I was like, oh yes, let's, 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 let's make sure that we create a space to have Christy come join us. If you've heard Christy's work, you'll know why I was so enthusiastic about having Christy join us and, and making sure that we were able to feature Christy for a new book showcase. A little bit more about Christy's accolades and accomplishments. Christy L. Williams received a Bachelor of Arts in English Creative Writing from St. Andrews Presbyterian College and an MA in Education in adult education, specifically at East Carolina University, her debut chapbook. And it's always a joy to support people that are just getting that first collection out. Her debut chapbook is Finding Her. And Finding Her has been published by Finishing Line Press. Her work has also been published in Main Street Rag, Dan River Review, Cairo, Maximum Tilt Solstice Anthology, Herman Feather, Hermit Feathers Review, and many other journals. When she is not playing with words, she is using her own story of quadriplegia and cerebral palsy to advance and advocate for herself and others with disabilities, participating in adaptive recreation, creating mixed media art and going to rock concerts. I'm assuming those are the musical kind as opposed to the stone kind, but could be both. Would you all please welcome Christy Williams. Hi everybody. I am excited to share finding her with all of you today. And so I'm gonna dive right in and start with the first poem in the book because that sets up what finding her is all about. This is titled One Minute. One minute to be who I was, to grieve my loss, to take stock of what I have, to accept it all, to strategize a forward move, to imagine one foot in front of the other, before quietly stepping into who I am now. And so now that we know where we are, I'd like to take you guys on a field trip with me to Target. This is titled Yoga Pants and it is probably one of my favorite poems that I've been asked to read since this whole ride started for me. Yoga Pants. Shopping at Target, I see them and smile. Remember wearing a similar pair? Sister yogas. These are heathered gray, 
a teal roll down band provides a backdrop of silvered leopard spot. Remembering my legs, strong and shapely, used to plant my feet, raise my bottom, bridge all my strength. My sister yogas assisted that derriere move. Squeezing tight, lifting body parts into perfect poses. My abs never carved, but always flat, stood at attention, saluting the colored swath that kissed my belly button and nuzzled its bejeweled ring. I have to try these on. Snatching them off the rack, I glide into the fitting room. Just outside my stall door, a full-length mirror waits. My eyes alight with hope as they adjust to the reflection. A fellow shopper smiles behind me. Oh, you precious thing. Those yoga pants hug your love bundle. And just like that, my belly button's unintentional smile opened wide the veil, swaddling my all too unrealistic fantasy, lost somewhere between not pregnant and not even almost flat. And that's a true story, y'all. That actually happened. So this next poem, I'm going to switch gears just a bit and say that this is a little bit about karma and a little bit about developing a thicker skin. This is titled, For the Maladjusted Gardener Who Would Be Culled by Her Own Brown Thumb. Sitting at the start, of a sandy path flanked by lush greenery. I hear your fingers digging as I listen to you pray to a God you've said you don't believe in for a sinkhole deep enough to stop a heart at its core. My screams reverberate wet with marrow I am still here as ripe red roses bloom out of my chest, climb skyward arms, and anchor themselves to extended legs. My being is now a pergola built to bear the brunt of you. I watch the earth open up and swallow you whole. This next poem, I'm going to give a trigger warning here because I address body image. And as a young girl growing up, I didn't always know that my body was okay as it was. And I feel that as adult women, it is our responsibility to give young girls that self-assurance early so that they don't struggle in their later years, I found that acceptance in my 40s. And so I feel that it is important for me to say that it is okay for me to appreciate my body and it is okay for others to appreciate my body as well. And so this poem is titled, Watching You Undress Me, A Love Letter to Body Image. You position me in front of the full length mirror, mounted on the back of a hush door. Kneeling in front of me, you unzip my left black butter soft leather booty and make quick work of my sheer nylon trouser sock. When you notice my downward gaze, boring a hole into beige carpet, you stop, crook a finger under my chin, delicately imploring me to see my pleasure. A glint in your eye 
forces me to feel the ridge of your thumb glide heel to toe. Both feet are exalted before I have steadied my reflection or chanced an exhale. I hear my skin whisper and bear witness to desire as your forefinger traces a keyhole cutout. The plum eyelet blouse seems to darken as my skin pinks and your index finger has loosed a single sateen button, inviting you to explore the nape of my neck. My arms raise themselves without a word. From behind my chair, your hands move up my red rib cage and over my head, relieving the tasteful top of its modest duty. Moving in front of me again, careful not to obstruct my view, you search out the hidden zipper of my lilac corduroy pants. The zipper's undoing spurs our moments, pushing up on my forearms. I lift my bottom, you tug at my waistband. Soon, my thighs gleam under soft light and string-tied panties. Triangled lace is the only thing between you, my reflection, and secrets from my netherworld. Underpinnings with crisscross hook and eye straps are floored by the sound snap of your deaf touch and the sight of twin orbs. Not realizing my arms have axed out my body, you tap my elbows. Arms reply with a slip to the side. I see spiciness truly reflected. Imperfect beauty is comfortable in its own skin. Thank you so much. These comments are lovely. If you would permit me, I would like to share a poem that is not in Finding Her. It will be a part of a new project, but it is relevant to what we're talking about today. Because as I was finding that acceptance within myself, my daddy passed away and he was my primary able-bodied caregiver. And when he died, within hours, I got a lot of unsolicited opinions about what my life should be now simply because he's not here. And so, although this poem didn't make it into finding her, it will be a part of a new project and it answers my question to what I, I plan to do and, and how I felt about those people that had so many opinions so early. This is titled Reasons Retreat Equals an Unsolved Equation. I asked you to use flyer miles before I am locked in the circumstance of my body, betrayed by disabled limbs whose only function is to subtract autonomy by degrees. You suggest we FaceTime while I count random variants on crooked fingers, terrified by how my freedoms will be divided through a process of elimination. I notice your packed suitcase is not a factor in my request. You are going on a save the animals retreat imbued with the righteous notion that no creature shall be denied its native habitat, insisting that zoos, by definition, have become dioramid prison camps, even if original intent may have included conservation. You promise my transition into institutionalized living will be humane, oblivious to the fact that I am about to be caged. Thank you. And so now I'm gonna take another turn and lighten the mood a bit and give this tribute to daddy's 
and daughters. This is called glitzed at the gym. Walking away from my workout, I'm paused mid corridor. As a budding ballerina pirouettes her exit from dance class. She sports a black leotard, white stocking feet and bejeweled tennis shoes. Her chauffeur is wearing landscaping gloves and a ball cap sunglasses resting on the bill. The pastel pink Hello Kitty knapsack slung over his right shoulder complements a plain black tee stretched across his chiseled frame. His left hand holds a hot pink Barbie lunch tote answering the glitter on the tip of his nose. Thank you. How am I doing on time? Am I good? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, I'm going to read one more poem that's not in the book. And it was just recently published in Heron Clan 9. And I wrote this to honor friends of mine that are getting the chance to start their families for the first time. And I'm enjoying all the new babies that I get to hold and cuddle. And so here we go. This is titled Ode to a Peach. Crushed velvet skin shelters a soul. A hearty pulped mouth exhales summer's seed. Succulent aroma speaks placenta's arrival. Her elan suffuses sunset's texture. And I always like to, when I'm, when I end a reading, I like to have a, a nice conclusion to uh, the work that I have presented. And I kind of like to bring things full circle. So I'm going to read the last poem in Finding Her. This is titled, A Digger's Lot. Sitting alone at time's end, reconciled by a single notion. Oh, I'm sorry, recoiled by a single notion. Only the whole she herself crafted cannot be reconciled. Thank you very much. And I would like to say that each time I have read with cultivating voices or participated as just a silent viewer, this has been a welcoming and open space and it was a gift to participate today. The gift is ours, Christy, for your presence and poetry and folks, as I always, I really like to marvel when a, a person particularly has their debut chapbook, open the reading, like to kind of uh, support the fact that finding her is now out and available, finishing line press. And Christy, your poetry, is so powerful and a testament to the resiliency of the body and so the spirit of the human spirit. And I also just want to say I appreciate those poems about the, rel the relationship between fathers and daughters in particular. I've been thinking a lot about that lately myself. So, so welcome. And again, everyone, we've had the opportunity to hear today, remarkable poetry and remarkable voice, Christy Williams. Thank you. And we'll see you again soon. I, or we'll hear you again soon, I hope. Absolutely.
Well, our next reader is also no stranger to cultivating voices, a very active uh, participant, uh, li poet, but also a citizen of cultivating voices like poetry, always encouraging people, posting often. And uh, I just, I, not only do I love Maeve poetry, but I, I love how, I, I love Maeve's community spirit and what she has brought to the group over the time that we've been together. And um, I'm just grateful to be able to hear Maeve's poetry today because I also have a fondness for a place I have never visited, that I have never been, which is Sligo. I have a fondness for Sligo, even though I've never been there. I long to visit uh, because of, I know that it's a very, very poetic space. It evokes much poetry and we are so fortunate today to be able to hear poetry of Maeve McKenna. Well, as I mentioned, Maeve McKenna is a poet living in Sligo, Ireland, and her poetry has been placed in several international poetry competitions and published in Mislexia, Orbis, Sand Magazine, Fly on the Wall, channel Culture Matters, the Highbone Journal, among many others, as well as print and widely online. Maeve was a finalist in the Ivan Boland Mentorship Award 2020. And as you as many of you know, uh, Ivan Boland has been an important touchstone for so many of us here in Cultivating Voices, live poetry. And it's been a, a joy to also introduce folks to the poetry of Ivan Boland. So to have a person who, a poet who has been honored in this way as a finalist for a, an award connected to Ivan Bolin is quite an accomplishment. Maeve also was third in the Canterbury Poet of the Year 2021 and a Pushcart nominee in 2022. So quite a grand pandemic run uh, due to Maeve's dedication to her craft. Her debut pamphlet, which was hard for me to believe that it was her debut. Her debut pamphlet published in February 2022, a dedication to drowning was introduced into the poetry world through Another press that I love, Fly on the Wall Press. A second pamphlet is forthcoming with Rare Swan Press. So we are overjoyed today to welcome Maeve McKenna and her debut pamphlet, A Dedication to Drowning, with anticipation, of course, to getting to hear from you again with your new work soon when. Uh, the second pamphlet comes out. Thank you again, Maeve, and uh, welcome to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry today. Thank you, Sandy. Gosh, hard to know what to say. Thanks so much for all that, and Kim for inviting me, and sorry I was so late and confused by everything. It must be, it's Sunday evening here in sunny Sligo. It's rarely sunny in Sligo, so it must have kind of just went to my head or something like that, you know, so. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna read a few poems just from the book. Um, a dedication to drowning by the wonderful fly in the wall press. I'd recommend anybody who might have some 
manuscript to send it in there. Terrific editor, Isabel Kenyon, um, brilliant play, press writer and um, focused. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna dive right in. A lot of the themes in this book are, um, you know, they're uh, about, you know, womanhood and uh, childhood and aging and grief, all of the things, sexuality, all of the things that really make us human, I suppose, and that, you know, are part of our lives. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is Performance. Uh, I hope my internet is okay, it looks a bit dodgy. Uh, performance. Wounded urine, yellow bruised and pungent with an assault of red in the bowl. Wait. The animals exist to devour their bodies and you make tasting yours a constant dying. You are guzzling fluids like a drought is cracking lines across your face. Fickled skin, itchy and tight, tingers, fingers can't warm there now. But oh, the latent tingle. Even the flesh funnel and its thirst dried up during those rare sultry summers. Then the makeshift wet. You came unbalanced, legs trembling on a circus wire, pounding applause inside your skin hobble. A ritual of one, years scampering over lust moist sheets, cold edges where we retreat. This is performance, persistent and loud, a tribute to self. And the baby, now a man, still clapping inside the audience of a woman. Thank you. And so, I mean, I just was going to dive straight in. So the first couple of poems, you know, touch on, um, I suppose I'm, uh, I find, uh, I could be quite interested, I don't mean to say it's the wrong way, in sexual intercourse and in how society perceives it and um you know what we're fed by it and um so you know the first poll the, the, the first poem i've just read is um considers if it is an act of unity or is it something kind of solitary and self-serving and this second poem um is on a similar theme and uh, it looks at it looks at a first sexual encounter i suppose in hindsight and um how we we reimagine that i suppose tent from the pocket radio, black magic swirls, air does too, then thickens, as if anything could get any darker. I've known you three hours and 34 minutes. You fidget at necking whiskey, take too long rolling a joint, seem kind. When the daddy long leg burrows landmines under, under the duffel coat blanket, I still tiptoe in, not revealing my fear of hearts living with wings, unreasonable to mention in a field hooded by white fumes, pretend angels we shelter under. Cellos sift from the shore, bloated pet names swept on a hissing sea salt, strings snared in seaweed on the fingerboard. Some sounds are too beautifully wooden. Earth shadows, we form a lunar eclipse with each body heave, thrust into the cold ground. Two spirits we leave there. Thank you. Um, the first poem in the book, um, you know, so I, I'm a mother of three children, three nearly adult, well, all, two adult and one nearly, well, taking a long time to be. But, um, and this poem explores the mother and child relationship. And um, I love my children dearly and we get on fantastically, just to preface it in case any of them are earwigging. Um, so yeah, I mean, this poem explores the, you know, the parent-child relationship, I suppose. And um, it's called The Sound of Distance. Your son is trying to kill you. He's thinking about it and you know this. You suggest a walk on the beach, idle water, the distraction of sand dunes and wind, the need for words lost to it when speech 
was still forming. He's been in his room for months, you say, but it's 15 years, really. You make pasta he has to navigate so you can watch him twist a fork around the loose bits, sometimes sucking the dangling threads of food into his mouth as he inhales, one eye on you, and it vanishes into the slurping silence of another mealtime. You say, isn't this nice? And it is the moment of him eating his jawline jutting through pale skin, fingers tapping, throat flexing. And without realizing, his chewing becomes all the noise you can hope for. A little boy, all pudgy shivering, togs falling off the crease of his bum, sand beneath his floppy toes, feet in your hands rubbing them warm, smiles sitting in the back of the car, just the two of you his favourite blanket, your fussing. Oh, the weightless quiet. The thud you hear after you hear it, lives in rear mirrors, too late to react when a deer propels itself into headlights. Each time you plummet into the depth of your child, birthday cards unopened. Thank you. And um, as Sandy mentioned, I live in very, very beautiful Sligo and uh, and I spend, you know, ridiculous amounts of time out in nature, walking on the beach with we've, we've animate beaches here, beautiful woods. Um, and I get great inspiration there. I, I feel very at peace there and have great space in my head and I adore the sea. I'm a water sign. I love the sea. Um, I'm terrified of seaweed, which is a problem, but I mostly get around that. But, you know, I, I adore the sea and I'm, I'm also really, you know, terrorized by the power of it. And so this poem um, it came about in Lizardell, which is a woodland and a beach. Lizardell House, very famous house, Kentis Markovich. And um, I imagined what it would be like to trust the sea, to just go and walk. And so this poem is very short. It's just one sentence, really. Dredge. I allow one thought to drown my current idealization of this walking to and beyond the debris of the shoreline, mutilated crabs upturned, bloated stomachs hardening under a rigid winter sun, guts thin trails snared in shriveled seaweed, several dismembered pincers crusting some feet away, dusty sea salt coating the edges of my lips, and I lick and lick, suck hard until bitter grit softens under my tongue, and I am alert again to its impurities, intent on pushing forward past the line of washed up shells, many shattered by my pacing back and forth, and further on the unrelenting horizon, Seagulls speckle a trawler's mast. I think I can swim to. I think. Thank you. Um, the title of the book is also a poem, a uh, second poem in the book. Uh, and I suppose basically this poem is about how we are compelled sometimes to go to the things that can destroy us. And, uh, and whilst we're, we can often be aware of it, we seem unable to stop ourselves. Um, a dedication to drowning. Stretched like a drum, a coating of me covers my skeletal frame. For now, I am crouched at the shoreline, the night's grip, my back a fist. Out past the cut of land and sea, where everything was once you and nothing was me, a kind of balance prevails. Not here though, not among the creeping pull lapping at my toes, luring me back inside the silence of water, the idle current a mouth full of promises echoing closer. Now I can't trust my feet, they are traitors like my mind, like your face. 
Sand is under everywhere you are not, as I think of you then swimming to shore. Your wide shoulders and orca's tail slicing the, the, slicing the surface, your head rising through the ripples. You asked me once why I never swim. I told you, drowning twice takes dedication. Thank you. Um, and, you know, the poem, the, the book takes detours and um, um, one, of, one of the great pains, heartache, I suppose, in Ireland is um, the mother and baby homes and the Magdalene laundries and the treatment of women over the generations and um, uh, a wound um, that, you know, is, I don't think will ever go away. And a few years ago, I watched a documentary about some of the women who were imprisoned, basically, in those places and how maybe 30, 40, 50 years later, they were, their lives were destroyed. And, um, and one particular woman uh, in, in, you know, after watching the program, I just felt compelled to write something. And so this was a very, very old poem. Um, and I was so happy that I could include it in the book. Um, it's called Shadow Waiting in memory of mother and baby homes. It's always November always 5 a.m. and you lie rigid in a cooling sweat, dawn yet to reach under the bolted door. Some hours earlier, you sat rocking at a bedsit window, a couple arm in arm cavort under shafts of orange. The distant shadows of love are unbearable. You are folding a sheet, tracing the edges with aging fingertips back and forth along each crease. You do this most nights. Others you spend polishing a brass flower vase. The thump of boots on the stairs propels you under the bed where you remain with the sin of unworn leather shoes. In the forgiveness of mourning, you lean in sit watching mothers walk away from their children, unsure if they blow a kiss. The day congregates around you in silence until once again, black noise descends, then separates, revealing faces, names, screams. It's 40 years since you were spared the shaved scalp, holy linen, Bunches of rosary beads as improvised fists. Your baby. Forty more years waiting for them to come for you. Thank you. And I'll finish with a the last poem in the book, actually. Um, and I suppose all of you here, if you're writers, you know the, 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 the joy and the agony of, of writing. And I, if you're like me, you sometimes question why you put yourself through it. And, um, but I suppose we, we have to. And um, what, we, what we're trying to do, I suppose, you know, is you know, keep on with our belief. And uh, that can be uh, impacted by so many things around us. It's a very busy world. It's a very busy, I don't know where all you are, but here in Ireland, it's a very busy writing world. And can sometimes seem quite competitive and um, and I, I don't really like that side of it at all. But anyway, I wrote this poem with the idea of, um, you know, uh, the cost of writing. Um, bookmarker. I knew its cost, heaving form agitated on the shelf, the weight and how it would buckle me. Not its thin story or desperate paragraphs that seat close to the edges of a blunt force ascent into oblivion. Or even the perfectly contagious sleekness of its covers in my hand. No, none of this. Not the aloofness of capitals, front cover a boarded up house in silhouette, wrought iron gates padlocked, the infant woman shoeless, fleeing. No, none of this nonsense. There is so much pain I yearn for. 
Paper cuts gather as a sequence of blades slicing against my thumb, eyes magnified, scanning each fitful page. I match words with the voices of panic, counsel truth in self-truth, nurse each sound into obscurity, wait for it to heal, then hurt. Is it by this hearts unbreak the more numbness invades us? Let's assemble our bodies limb to limb against the walls of unoccupied margins. Hope pointed like the scope of a firing squad. Every cry of submission as bullet hits bone, a reason for applause. I am writing it for you, for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Please may check out the comments and uh, Thank you. oh my Thank gosh. You. Um, Thank you so much. What a reading, the precision of language. I mean, everyone, we were we were drowned in the in the beauty of the imagery today and the language and I felt like I was just awash in the poetry. It's why I go to the sea of poetry. It's why I go to the sea and why I go to the sea of poetry. Thank you. Is, um, is, Thank is you. to hear poems like, is to hear poems like yours, honestly, honestly. I mean, we share a love of the sea and yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, oh my gosh. Come Everyone. visit, Sandy. Come visit us. Come visit. I'll I bring you. I long for the day, and I, I I await it. I can't wait. It will happen. It will happen. It will happen indeed. Thank you. Um, and then we can write poems together, <laughs> folks. From Fly on the Wall Press, um, and uh, and Maeve mentioned, uh, you know, Bell Kenyon is 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 such such an innovative editor and we have other members who published uh, their work with Fly on the Wall. Uh, the debut pamphlet, again, just marvel at these two, at our, at these two, at these two women today for their, their debut, their debut collections. Maves is a dedication to drowning. Wow. Well, we continue. <laughs> what a what a reading, Sylvia, right? I mean, wow. What a reading so Ooh. far. <laughs> and now we get to hear your poem. And now we get to hear your poems. I've known Sylvia for a number of years. We are fortunate sisters in a group called Poets on the Coast, founded by the illustrious uh, Kelly Russell Agaden and Susan Rich. And the poets, that, the poets that I've been able, the women poets I've been able to meet through Poets on the Coast, astound, they astound me in their dedication to their work. And I am always just so, I'm so glad when one of them, one of my sisters achieves that, that plateau of being able to publish a collection of their work. And it's been fabulous to watch your journey with your, this, the, the latest work of yours, risking it. We waited a long time to get you on, but it's all the sweeter to have not well you've read with us before, of course, um, but to celebrate to celebrate the publication of this particular collection risking it and. Um, folks when you hear the poems today, the way that Sylvia will put this together for you. You will know that it's been well worth 
well worth the wait and that you will want to hear her read from it again very, very, very soon. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about our uh, also very dear, dedicated Cultivating Voices Live member supports you in, in attending many of our readings here live in Zoom, Sylvia Pollock. Sylvia Byrne Pollock has illuminated also poetry for time memorial, it seems. The poems of Sylvia Byrne Pollock, who is a hard of hearing retired cancer researcher, have appeared in Floating Bridge Review, Crab Creek Review, The Stillwater Review, and many other print and online journals. A two-time Pushcart nominee, she won the 2013 Mason's Road Literary Award, was a 2019 Jack Straw writer, which is an incredible program uh, in Seattle to uh, encourage and promote poets in that community for how to be in community with one another and also learn the, the craft of promoting their work and was also a 2021 Mineral School resident. One of my favorite residencies that I've never been to, but I love <laughs> driving by Mineral School, going to readings at Mineral School. It's an, it's, an, um, it's an old school house at the base of uh, Mount Rainier area. Incredible place. Her debut full length collection, Risking It, was published by Red Mountain Press in 2021. She's just coming up onto the one year anniversary of the publication. She lives in Seattle, but her poetry ranges far and wide. Would you please welcome Sylvia Byrne Pollock. Thank you, Sandy. And, and I hope my Irish sisters who are reading here notice that my middle name is, what is it, like the fourth most common name in Ireland. So I, I feel connected to you all. Anyway, I thought it's summer, even though here in Seattle, it's cloudy today and in the 60s, but I wanted to start out with something called vagrant waltz, as well as, of course, saying thank you to Sandy and Kim and Don who make this thing work and it's just wonderful. So vagrant waltz. It's time in midsummer to think about nothing, turn from ideas, make ice cream instead, float on a raft of popsicle sticks. You'll know when to get up, wield pencils like chopsticks, tease apart vagabond thoughts meandering through your mind, when bedraggled ideas knock at your door, don't turn them away. Like your mother before you, give handouts to hobos, a sketch of a cat will be etched on your gate. Words will come tramping into your dreams, vamp your domesticated mind. With rumbles, a jungle utterly outside your safe picket fence. Oh, there's that kind of delicious tension between safety and risk. And um, on to read next, the title poem from my book. Oh, oh, I should show you. Here it is, Risking It. Risking It. If it's confidently proclaimed, a name for this large orange mushroom, glistening in rain beside a Galliano Island trail, does that make it safe to eat? Is it better simply to admire its vibrant copper flesh, the way it binds raindrops, stands alone in a patch of small ferns and grasses? Suppose a mycologist quotes genus and species, shows drawings in an atlas, will it be tantalizing enough to take this lush fungus into the kitchen, saute it with shallots, make a risotto. 
These are the questions we face every day. Who to trust, what to eat, how to prepare for death. Well, of course, it's part of our humanness to be aware of death and uh, think about it. Um, we don't know about other creatures on this earth, but uh, I want to read you next a poem called Flagrance, which is about a, a cherry tree in our yard that uh, unfortunately had to be taken down. Flagrance. Our cherry tree was sick, girdled by larking teenage boys, bark cut so deep, sap couldn't flow between roots and leaves. Yet in its final year, before we had to cut it down, that tree put out such an extravagance of blooms, produced so many cherries, there were enough for both the crows and us. Dying trees do this, an arborist explained, create as much fruit as they can, potential progeny to keep the lineage going. Even cherries cultivated solely for their clouds of pink and white spring flowers will show it a last bonsai. When the Tohoku tsunami roared in on waves that topped a hundred feet, traveled inland six miles in some places, it destroyed people, houses, temples, highways, trees. Brine shrimp and automobiles were flung like offerings at the feet of Tohoku's cherry trees. Those not ripped out on that March day were soaked in brine, pickled like omiboshi. Nothing could save them. And still, they mustered what they could, commanded hungered buds to open in great billows, otherworldly in their ghostly beauty, to blot out desolation, decorate despair a flagrant rapture of blossoms. Cherry trees have been in my life since graduate school days uh, because I worked with a kind of moth that lived on cherry trees. And this poem is called, I'm nearer the end of my life than the middle. Long ago, I studied bright-winged cecropia moths their wingspans as wide as my hand. Petite eggs hatched into ravenous hairy black larvae, growing plump on the leaves of my professor's cherry trees. The larvae molted four times, instar to instar, crawling out of their old skin each time, and they ate it. With each stage, the larvae grew bigger, brighter, morphing to yellow and orange, Coming at last overstuffed, blue knobbed emerald caterpillars. Compelled by their hormones, they spun brown silk sarcophagy and waited for winter to transform their russet husks into spring's multi hued wings. Without a hard freeze, that last step isn't triggered. I have known winter, it came undisguised. I could show you scars, but I won't. What matters now is this question. Why am I still afraid to dance all night with my soul, to be drunk with her, to rip open the cocoon and emerge? There's a section of the book that has to do with being hard of hearing. And there's a series of poems called, uh, or about a persona called the deaf woman, kind of loosely modeled on Marvin Bell's marvelous dead man poems. Prayer falling on deaf ears. Dear God, please send a decoder, an angel with mellifluous voice to perch in the rim of my ear. Make her multi-armed, so she can catch, parse, and juggle the staccato bursts of racket, soaring sibilants that pass for human speech. Let her have a device to analyze the incoming cacophony 
assemble syllables, give her an algorithm to detect possible words in English, try them out for meaning in the context of a rapid conversation. What I'm saying, God, is that she must be fast, perceptive, imaginative, and indefatigable. Try her out on those words. If you can't detail an angel to me, perhaps you can put video displays on the forehead of each person I meet. Like supertitles at the opera, their words will scroll across the gen gently across the wrinkles. If you'll do this, I promise to stop nodding inanely, laughing or looking serious at the wrong time. I will be a credit to your handiwork. If you decide to answer me, God, please stand squarely in front of me. Let me see your lips when you speak. What the deaf woman sees. The deaf woman sees trouble wherever she looks. In front, behind, to the sides, up above, beneath. She sees it in the future, the past, right this moment, sprawling and ugly. It slobbers and snorts as it pries open her eyelids in the after midnight hours. It rouses the deaf woman from sleep, dulls her senses. She senses her dullness. The deaf woman sees people selling their souls, their grandmothers, their firstborns on the open market, on the World Wide Web, at community swap meets, in frenzies of free trade. They are busy buying, selling, texting, tweeting. Don't notice their rights being amended, shortened, hemmed in, curtailed, trimmed, tased. The people are outfoxed, but blithely insist they still own the chicken coop, even while it and their national parks are given away. The magnetic pull of the spectacle is too strong. She can't look away. But the deaf woman can't hear. The deaf woman doesn't hear the screams from the gas chamber. The gas chambers are silent as far as she's concerned, but the stench is remarkable. Interestingly, no one talks about it, a form of politeness like ignoring the hiccup, the belch, the fart. The camps are wonders of efficiency, debasement, sadism, torture, murder, with their tawdry tattoos, blue numbers on forearms, stacked bunks in the barracks, rotten rations. What comes next in my country, wonders the deaf woman, the disabled woman, the disposable woman. Facing sunset. Facing sunset is different, of course, from gazing at brilliant tropical mornings with colors of mangoes and berries streaking the sky or tracking the gradual rollback of fog, mist burning off as the sun works its way down to the Northwest coast. No, this is more a relinquishing, letting go of the rheostat, no longer trying to control the light or the dark, just letting it happen slow degree by degree, the shifting of colors and focus, the lovely word dusk painting the undersides of cumulus clouds, the final flare of color and light as the sun dips into the sea, where today is extinguished, memories elide, and night's mystery floats like a hand-carved bentwood box waiting to be opened. 
And I'll end with a, a short poem. And again, thanks to all of you, all of you who have read, all of you who are here today, and to Sandy and Kim and Don. Um, this last poem was inspired by Helen MacDonald's book, Hawk, which is one of my favorite books. And this is my Ars Poetica. The poem that declines to be written because it is self-conscious, shy, cryptic, or shallow, is a poem that must nevertheless be treated with respect, like a wild goshawk. Don't try to take off his hood too soon. Let it rest in the dark as the two of you get to know each other. Your voice is important. When the day comes, let it fly. Watch where it soars. If it disappears into the forest, you must let it go. But if it flies back, feed it. Thank you. That's a perfect, that's a perfect closure poem. Like it's just, I, I always love when a poem, when a poet has a poem that like, that just brings the reading exactly to where it needs to be. And, uh, and I've heard you read that poem before and every single time, I just, I just marvel at that. I just, I just marvel at where that poem takes us and 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 how it is that perfect closure. I, I it never, it, I never tire of it, as I never tire of hearing from the collection that we've just heard from. And again, I'm, I'm always amazed that it's your, that it's the debut collection too. But it, nevertheless, folks, it is risking it from Red Mountain Press. You will want this for your collection, so please do take a gander in the chat where you can purchase any or all of today's collections, a reminder. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for bringing you know, your remarkable voice, your vision, that 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 hawk like that <laughs> hawk like precision precision oh, to thank you the more incredible absolutely incredible until next time well uh, we've reached our final poet for today and I am. I am just amazed and astounded and full of joy and wonder whenever I get to hear Moira Donaldson share her poetry. And I will say that we've been fortunate to hear Moira's work with us from the early days of Cultivating Voices when we were just getting started and people were looking for those venues to read as they were launching their collections. And so we were able to hear from her previous collection, Carnivorous, which if you've not partaken of, please go to our archives, search for Moira and her readings previous will come up. In fact, maybe I'll go back and I'll, I'll post them so that you can see her previous contributions to Cultivating Voices live poetry. But today's will not disappoint you at all from the latest collection, Bone House, which I had the extreme pleasure of being able to go to the launch of in 2020 
one. So again, coming up on that first year anniversary and like Sylvia, we had certainly hoped to have you within that one year period, but it thought it would be much sooner and we're grateful to have you here today um, to, to close us out and to really to celebrate this incredible collection, Bone House. Well, a little more about Moira Donaldson, if you are not familiar with her remarkable journey and career in poetry. Moira Donaldson is a poet and creative writing facilitator from County Down. She's published nine collections of poetry and has been involved in various collaborations with visual artists, most recently with Wexford artist Patty Lennon, resulting in the limited edition publication of artwork and poems, Blood Horses, which we've heard, we heard her read from here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry. She, she has a deep, deep affinity with the, in, with the incredible and powerful animal that we know as the horse. Her work is widely anthologized and she has read in festivals in Europe, Canada, and America. And in 2019, she received a major individual artist award from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. Her latest collection, as I mentioned, is Bone House. And that was published by Door Press in 2021. You please, please welcome Moira Donaldson. Oh, thank you so much, Sandy. It's such a, um, a delight and a privilege to be back. To, uh, to be back here again and I just so enjoyed listening to everyone's readings this evening. Thanks Sandy, Kim and Don for the opportunity to be here. Um, Bone House, as you mentioned, is out just coming up on a year. Um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's quite a strange structure, I suppose there are four poems within the collection all called Bone House and they came from, in my mind, to kind of um, be the little kind of spiny processes on which the rest of the, the collection was hung. So I'll read the first of the Bone House poems. Bone House. Skin a cat more ways than that. Rat-a-tat-tat. Open the door and see who's there, I dare you. Father becomes dust. Father who carried fire, heat to the hearth. Mother gets no rest, parading through the night, eternal like the moon. Of all the impossible things, the worst is her sadness, haunted because not humbled. Sit beneath the weight of days until you become stone, fossil. What was this? Did this once live? It was not their lives that mattered, it was their lives that mattered. It's little things like the electric candles screwed onto the piano. Here's the moon again in the aftermath with the rain falling and only a small stone in my hand. All that fear and hope and pleading, all that needing to be saved. A son's a son till he gets a wife, a daughter's a daughter all of her life. Under the moon, my mother. So this, um, collection is largely about mothers and daughters. It was really interesting earlier on listening to other people about fathers and daughters and, and parents and children. And so this book is um, very much kind of focused on the mother daughter relationship. Um, it's also one another element, I suppose, in the book is the fact that I was brought up in a very fundamental religious uh, family um, and the effect that that has on on children, on relationships, on all kinds of things. So um, this poem is called None Righteous. I pin a gathered rosebud to the collar of my coat. Its scent lifts instant, innocent. I forget much. Stretches of years empty as desert, featureless. But this mystic rose growing on the stem of a preacher's voice has memory in it, rising like summer mist. We sing of being sunbeams, while above us, 
God the Father hangs in the thunderous air. Going through doors and closing them behind me. There is a boy in a kilt, a pedal car and a hatch from the kitchen into the sick room, a budgie in a cage, a piano and an attic. The caged budgie is always called Joey, cuttlefish bone and millet, a glass fronted fire and a monster in the cupboard with the books. The farm is plastic, little plastic cows and pigs and sheep. The farmer's wife carries a silver pail and wears a headscarf. Two women in a bed, a gas fire, a kitchen made of tin, oil paintings of boats and beaches, stories of boarding schools, cocker spaniels, and radio signals coming through the air, transmitting things that the girl sitting on the floor doesn't understand, a distance from home, part there and part elsewhere, forever and ever, amen, on a long winter afternoon. The whole way down the corridor from the bedroom, sensation of being followed, of someone about to touch you on your back, and a child announcing its conception on an antique bed that smelt of damp and kept the shape of other occupants. I suppose one of the uh, one of the things of being a well being a mother, being a parent, is fear for your children. And Maeve earlier on was talking about, um, you know, the, that kind of idea of being drawn to the things that can destroy you. And I think we all worry about our children in lots of ways. And this poem um, um, starts with an epigram from Janice Winehouse, who was Amy Winehouse's mother. I listened to a documentary on the radio um, which was uh, Janice Weinhouse talking about Amy after she died. And she said, the relentless cycle of thinking you would lose her and then not losing her. Each time I saw her, I thought it would be the last. Daughters who dance with death. And after years of it, it takes little to pitch you into the panic that it has happened and how will you bear it when finally you hear and if it's not time, it may be the next round and round you dance with it. And this poem is um, after a painting by Rembrandt, um, The Adoration of the Shepherds with a Lamp. Mary's face is an exhausted moon, shadows dark under her eyes. And it is with reluctance that she parts her cloak to reveal the infant sleeping, oblivious in her lap. In Amsterdam, the artist inks a new plate, the descent from the cross, the dark night over Golgotha. And I think um, the other thing about um, mothers, um, whether again, whether mothers of daughters or sons is the kind of um, the fierceness that we have to put in protecting our children and here in the north of Ireland and I'm sure it's, uh, it's very similar in other places but in the north it is particularly linked to ex-paramilitaries who are now gangs in the um, in both communities and all communities in the big estates um, and they run the run the communities um, that under um, drugs, uh, drugs barns, really. Um, so this poem is uh, Hecuba in the Button Estate, and the Button Estate is a, an estate quite close to where I live. And it starts again with a little epigraph from Dante, um, from the Inferno. And reft of sense did she bark like a dog, such mighty power had a grief to wrench her soul. I am the lip curled car that can't be cast aside. You can't outstep me despite the booze and bluster with the boys, the red handed comrades, the drug runners, the ones you send to take a baseball bat to a girl in an upstairs flat, big man. I am the bitch mother that howls outside your window on those dark nights when sleep is hard to find. 
Mind you never leave your door ajar, or I'll be in your bed with you, blood on my mad jaws, tearing open the yellow flab of your belly, eating your balls. Uh, do I have a little bit more time, Sandy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll be good. Okay, this poem is called uh, My Daughter Cuts My Fringe. I close my eyes, feel the scissors slide across my forehead, cool and smooth. Snips of hair fall into my hands, upturned in my lap. And into my lap, a memory, arguing with my mother while brushing my daughter's hair, dragging through tangles, her head jerked back by my roughness, full of anger at my mother, hurting my daughter. Um, okay. A sudden shaft of light. My demented mother, who doesn't know me anymore, looks up as I come into the room. Ah, oh, there's my wee darling Moira, she says. Such love in her voice that everything falls away but love. The slate is clean, and I, newborn again and perfect, Know myself, beloved daughter, before the darkness closes in again. And I'll finish with just um, two, two short poems because over the um, over the space of um, the pandemic, I have become a, a grandmother to a granddaughter, so that's another generation of uh, of women um, in, in my life. And I'm going to um, read two short poems, one of which is in the in the collection. Um, my granddaughter was born just before the collection came out. Um, and this poem is called Hearing. Our singing bowl's been silent for years, dusty among raven, swan, hare, lucky elephants. I pick it up, hold it in my palm and strike felted stick against the beaten brass and the baby's eyes widen. She smiles, delighted, as concentric rings of pure sign fill the ordinary day with what could be prayer. And I'll finish just with this really tiny little poem, um, which um, as a, my granddaughter will be um, coming up on three in, in August. And um, it's just been such a delight to, um, to watch her grow and watch her acquire language, which is a really amazing thing to watch. I think when you have your own children, you're so busy just kind of trying to keep them, keep them alive that you don't get a chance to enjoy them so much. So um, anyway, this little poem is just called Granddaughter. You offer your upturned hand to the wonder of water falling. Drops gather in the small cup of your palm. I name it for you. Rain, and you give it back to me. The tired world, all new again. Thank you. No, oh, I could. I, you know, I could listen. I could. I could listen to you read the whole book all day long, all nine collections. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. I have to say, I have to say, Sandy, I love when you say my name, it sounds really mellifluous, you know, it's a, it's your accent, you know, so you, you can introduce me anytime to say my name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to just remind everybody the collection by Moira Donaldson is the Bone House from Door Press. And what what I what I what what I find very poignant, in particular about about these poems is um, they're they are very. You mentioned this often. You you use the word tiny, but they are but they are they are so magnificent enlarge that they, they they expand the
the space always that they have on the page through the way that through the way that you create a, a line and a thread uh, through through the portrait of each of your poems. And Thank I you. could never in a million years do what you do. And I, I, I find it miraculous and it's what I love so much about 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 the poetry that I've that I've had the pleasure to read. I haven't read your whole you. book of work. But I, I, I really, folks, if you, if you are eager to see um, what a shorter, the, the power of a shorter compact poem can do, look no further than what Moira Donaldson does um, as a poet. Um, she's a master at it, uh, just an absolute master. Um, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, thank you. Well, everyone, we've had such an incredible new book showcase today. I hope you'll agree that these four poets, these these four miraculous poets, have have taken us on a beautiful, beautiful uh, journey through uh, through through generations of time, generations of relationships, generations of. Uh, of how we relate to um, our own bodies and the bodies of others and the bodies of what inhabits the earth, like our relationship from shore to sea. Um, it's, it is, it has been full of, I'll, I'll use, I'll use Joyce, full of sound and fury, but signifying everything, everything got signified today. And um, I'm so grateful to have heard, for us to have heard today from Christy Williams, Maeve McKenna, Sylvia, Bern Pollock and Moira Donaldson. Before I close out with some remarks, let's take a moment, unmute, and show our deep appreciation for the music and the truth and the and the power that we heard today. Ray, fabulous. Yes, yes, yes. Fabulous. Yes, yes. Encore. <laughs> Encore, indeed. Encore, <laughs> indeed. I'd, I'd bring this for, I'd bring this quartet back any day, any day. I, I, I love the, I love the musical arrangement of this. I always talk about an alchemy happens. We, you know, an alchemy will happen and, and, Oh, we heard it today. We heard it today. That wave, that wave of the poets, of the wave of the four poets today. Well, everyone, you've been enjoying, appreciating, experiencing the poetry in Cultivating Voices Live Poetry today, our new books showcase, where we feature sometimes three, usually four poets couple times a month. Um, and again today, uh, as I mentioned, we heard from, it, we were able to hear from Christy Williams' debut, debut chapbook, Finding Her, Maeve McKenna, a Dedication to Drowning, Sylvia Byrne Pollock, Risking It, and Moira Donaldson, Bone House. Please, if you are so inclined, you've heard the work today and you can have the work to, to read and contemplate and share on your own. Um, look for our links. Uh, we'll be also posting them again tomorrow on our Cultivating Voices Live Poetry Facebook page. Um, poetry books, of course, always make great gifts for our own souls, but for to share with others. 
what if poet what what if not to share poetry with others so if not to buy a collection for yourself buy one for one of your beloveds and share the the wealth of these of these tremendous poets voices today well we've been able to share these four featured today but next week we return on sunday where you can be the features, my friend. You know, it's our wild card open mic. If you come in uh, 15 minutes before the reading, which is, um, you know, the 45, the, on, the, on the 45, uh, which, whichever time zone you're in, you can be one of uh, 12 to 15 folks that usually have five minutes a piece usually, and uh, we'll get as many voices in as we can to share where you get to be the featured poet. And then what I love to always say about cultivating voices poetry is often folks who read in the open mic are often then features in one of our longer extended readings and vice versa. That's really the beauty I think of this format and switching it up is that um, any day, uh, the uh, any day and any time our open mic poets are, are our featured poets and vice versa. So I hope you will come back next week and consider sharing your work and, or of course, listening to the work. I think listening is equally as powerful and important. It's been um, a marvel today and uh, just such a powerful reading. And I'm grateful to have had all of you in the audience with your attentiveness and your enthusiasm here in Zoom and on Facebook. And as I said, I hope you will come back next week and join us again uh, with your own poems to share. Well, I hope you all have a great week. And, you know, as I, as I say every single week, you know, folks out there just, Stay safe, take exquisite care of your beloveds, and of course, keep writing, keep writing that mo those, those poems that you are compelled to write because we all, we all need, we all need to hear your work. Sandy, you know, for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'll see you next Sunday. Take good care. And see you next time. <laughs>